Hi guys, I'm Max Kausch from AndesSpecialist.com and I'm here to talk about Aconcagua equipment. Uh, we have a lot to talk about, so we're going to break up the list uh, in a smaller bit. I hope you enjoy it. Okay, Aconcagua is a, is a very big mountain. Uh, it's the highest in the, in the Andes uh, and it's the highest in the world outside the Himalayas. Uh, it's 6962. Uh, that's a very big 6000. I would say for 6000 meter peaks, I have climbed many of them, uh, actually in a project of climbing them all in the Andes. Uh, and what I figure out, Aconcagua is not too hard. Uh, we we have a very strong uh, logistics, we bring a lot of stuff for our clients, so that makes the mountain easier. Uh, so it's not a mountain you have to technically climb with your hands, but it's a mountain you actually trek. Uh, because of that, many people think it's an easy mountain, uh, and they forget about the altitude, they forget about how much time you spend on the mountain, you're nearly there for two weeks. Um, so these are, these are, these are uh, things that uh, people forget and uh, they, uh, they they tend to ignore and at the end uh, they are quite heavy you know if you add all these items together they're quite heavy on you uh, so uh, the experience needed for a mountain like this is of uh, I would ideally if you have climbed a 6,000 meter peak before uh, that would be ideal or uh, a mountain like a long trek like Kilimanjaro and a slightly technical mountain and cold mountain like Elbrus. Okay, that's enough. Uh, of course, the more experience you have, the more uh, uh, summit uh, success, uh, you, you, more chances you have to reach in the summit. Uh, uh, obviously, treks, uh, doing long treks carrying uh, a rucksack, that is obviously, that adds up uh, to the, the experience uh, you need for Aconcagua. We don't normally deal with uh, uh, winter conditions. We don't have to deal with that much snow and we don't have to deal with glaciers normally. Sometimes we do have bad storms there and uh, we have to deal with all the conditions. Uh, we, do, we run trainings. I run trainings at the end of every day. Uh, uh, we, get, we gather everyone together and I train. We talk about what we're going to do next day and what sort of equipment you should use the next day. If someone doesn't know a specific item, for instance, a, a, a ice axe or a crampon, uh, we do have a little class on how to use this equipment, how to address the rucksack, how to uh, um, uh, sleep properly. And so we, we actually uh, have these meetings uh, every night in, in Aconcagua. And also we have a big meeting in Mendoza uh, after you guys arrive, we gather everyone together, you meet the rest of the guides and uh, we talk about every single bit, every single aspect on the expedition. As far as uh, fitness training uh, for this mountain, uh, I would not worry about uh, gaining muscle. A lot of people go to the gym and they end up gaining muscle. That's not needed for Aconcagua. All you have to focus on is cardio, okay? Uh, running, swimming, uh, there are many different ways of, of training your cardio. Ideally, you go to a you know, go trekking and carrying uh, rucksacks and climbing smaller mountains. That's the ideal train. But we know the reality in a city uh, is that's not very fireable for, for, for um, the, the, the amount you can train in a city. So uh, if you do have uh, time in a city, uh, I would go for probably one hour training uh, every day. One hour, maybe I wouldn't go for half an hour. That's I don't think that's enough. And I wouldn't. If, if I'm running, I wouldn't run in my limit. I would uh, stick to about 85% uh, of what I can do. Uh, and I would focus on the amount of time I'm, I'm, I'm running uh, rather than the, the amount of power and the speed I can run, okay? So you have to uh, be very careful to not hurt yourself. Uh, it happens a lot. I mean, my clients uh, are training and sometimes they cannot train properly. And uh, when they get in closer to the expedition, they end up pushing themselves a lot because they, they have to stick to a program or something and they end up hurting themselves. So uh, be very careful with that and, uh, and the amount of, of uh, uh, running you do. I would rotate exercises, not just running, 
probably uh, uh, swimming, trekking, this is a, is a very good cardio exercise. Cycling, biking, uh, I would, the important thing is that you actually rotate them. Well, Aconcagua is a, is a fairly expensive mountain. Um, the amount of money you would expend, uh, apart from the cost of the expedition, uh, well, actually, if you find another company that offers the same stuff we offer uh, for a smaller price, you can just tell us and we cover up the price, no problem. Uh, but apart from that, you have uh, expenses on the permit. Uh, the reason why we don't actually uh, add the expense with the main price of the, of the mountain is because we don't know uh, the, how much the permit is going to be until uh, November 21st every year. They only publish the, the uh, permit, the climbing permit price, uh, November 21st. So that's uh, in 2000, 2018 and 2019 season uh, is of $800 in the high season and, and it drops to less than $500 uh, in the February season. Uh, apart from that, you might have expenditure hiring porters. Uh, an average when someone hires a porter, about 30% of our clients hire porters and an average expenditure there is probably $500, $550 on that. Uh, also renting equipment, we did publish a list of uh, the, all the rentals, the price of the rentals in our website. We have that on the, on the frequently asked questions. Uh, is all listed, uh, but an average expenditure for that will be about $350 to $400. Uh, you also have about $150 uh, uh, expenditure on food uh, in Mendoza, the amount of meals you're having, so we do not cover that. And uh, you also have the flight. Uh, also on the mountain, if you leave, for some reason you leave the expedition, uh, uh, before the rest of the team leaves for whatever reason that could be medical that could be personal uh, you never know what can happen so uh, uh, you should have $400 on you in order to drop back to base camp have another guide going with you uh, to the entrance of the park and then have private transportation back that might cost you uh, about $400 up to $400 so that would be safe to have the money on you uh, and, and I hope you will not expend it. And uh, for helicopter rescue, helicopter rescues are not longer covered uh, in the permit. But two years ago, if you pay for the permit, uh, the, the helicopter, the possible helicopter rescue was covered. That does not happen any longer and you have to pay. Uh, helicopter rescue from base camp, from Plaza de Mulas, costs uh, $1,800. Uh, the only insurance company that have a partnership with Aconcagua is uh, Global Rescue. We do have a link with the partnership, it's listed, uh, it's listed on the requirements. Uh, you can, all you have to do is click there and it will send you uh, to our partner uh, page in, uh, in Global Rescue. It's, all the information is listed there. So the only uh, company that would actually pay for your rescue in case you need would be Global Rescue. All the other insurances if they cover the altitude uh, uh, mentioned, I mean, we, we're gonna be at 4.3 thousand meters at uh, a base camp, but if something happens above base camp, be careful. Some insurances do not cover extreme altitudes. So do check on your policy if the Aconcagua is covered. There are not many options out there, maybe three. Uh, but the way it works, uh, you have to hire the insurance. You have to pay for the helicopter, you will get a receipt, you will get a letter from us and you will send it to your insurance and the insurance will reimburse you. And that's how it works. Uh, all the insurances apart from uh, Global Rescue uh, work in that way. We do focus our expeditions uh, in the acclimatization. We have a very good uh, acclimatization plan. And what we do is uh, climbing higher camps and dropping back to sleep lower. So that kind of tricks your body to believe that you are in a longer period of time in high altitudes where uh, you actually aren't. You back, you're sleeping back at base camp. We call this strategy uh, carry high, sleeping low. It actually works pretty well. So we do that from base camp onwards and we do that and uh, approach camp, which is called Com Confluencia. Yeah, we actually go to Confluencia, which is 3.4 thousand meters. Then we climb up to uh, uh, 4.1 thousand meters and drop back to uh, 3.8. That kind of helps with the, with the whole acclimatization. We do focus our, uh, um, our expedition in, uh, in, in a good acclimatization plan. 
uh, we have a nice 17 day itinerary. However, uh, I do not like to stick to them. Uh, I, I prefer to have a flexible itinerary. Uh, I know people wanted to stick to dates, uh, but we are actually flexible because the weather changes so much and acclimatization sometimes has to change because the whole team might not be acclimatizing well. So we might use up some rest days uh, or even some second uh, attempts. You know, we have uh, two days for summit attempt. We might use up those days before or we might use those days later. So uh, I don't like people to be to stick to the itinerary too much. Uh, in reality, actually, we have a, a spare uh, summit attempt day but the reality of it is not, it, it doesn't really work. Um, you know, you cannot climb, attempt to climb a mountain like Aconcagua, come, come back down and then try it again next day. You have to be a very strong person to do that. Normally when people try it, uh, even try and back, go back to camp, they're quite wasted. So uh, uh, the way it works is really is to try it once and do it well, you know, to, to find a, a, a good, uh, summit window, we need a uh, low winds, winds uh, at least to uh, up to maybe 35, 40 kilometers an hour. That's kind of doable. It's not ideal, but doable. Uh, we, to do that, we use a, a, a forecast system. We actually have that in our sat phones. Uh, we have a, a system as a robot that replies with the, with the uh, conditions, with the wind direction, wind speed and precipitation and we can get that in real time anywhere we are. So we can actually uh, get to a very good, a very accurate uh, summit uh, window. You know, we've been doing that for last four years in a row and we have a very high uh, summit success rate. Uh, this is one of the reasons. And the other reason is acclimatization. Uh, we do check in our clients every day. We, we run this test called Lake Louise table um, and uh, Lake Louise score table. Uh, it, what we do is uh, we check the oxygen saturation on everyone every night in every camp. We check the uh, heart levels, the heart rate in every camp every night on everyone and we actually also check the symptoms uh, on everyone. So uh, no, we haven't had for, for a few years now, we haven't had any major problems. Uh, of course people might develop some altitude disease, uh, some, some altitude related diseases but they never get to a, a, a very advanced stages. We actually uh, uh, pick up this, this, uh, these diseases before they develop, so we can uh, take people back down the mountain and they never get in trouble. Uh, uh, I think this is one of the main aspects uh, under the specialists. And the other main aspect that we have uh, is, is that we focus on experience. We have very experienced guides and our ratio is normally higher we have a, a higher number of guides than normal, uh, so people can split in different speeds, you know, and, and, and different strengths. Of course, uh, not everyone uh, um, adapts the same way, you know, I'll remind you, uh, the uh, human body um, uh, has different genetics, okay? Not everyone uh, is the same, so people adapt differently. This is actually gen uh, related to uh, uh, genetics. So uh, uh, we already know that and we already expect people to adapt in different, uh, different speeds. So this is why we bring more guides and uh, so we don't, uh, we don't actually have to force everyone to a single pace or a date. And this is why we're having a higher uh, success rate. Uh, also uh, linked to logistics, we take a very strong logistics to higher camps. We uh, even set up uh, a dome tent at uh, Camp 2, which is 5.6 thousand. Uh, so having decent food, like not freeze-dry packed food, we actually cook very complex meals up there. You'll be actually be impressed. Uh, we actually take uh, uh, cooking um, um, pressure pots up there. We can cook um, a lot of different uh, dishes. So uh, that actually helps people, you know, that kind of comfort actually helps people a lot uh, on acclimatizations. Uh, we, we actually spent two nights at uh, Camp 2 at 5.6 thousand. Um, people normally don't do that. They go up to Camp 3. They don't actually rest. They uh, do one trip to Camp 3, carrying it and coming back. We normally take a rest day and that actually helps a lot on acclimatization. So I would say these uh, items added together, uh, they actually help our clients a lot to have a, a higher uh, uh, summit success uh, ratio. 
So we have most of the information uh, written down in our website. It's actually uh, um, all very well written and separated. Uh, we have a, a, a big section with a lot of questions, uh, frequently asked questions, FAQ. Uh, there are many questions there that you might have. Uh, I would ask you to read that. And also the equipment list is all, is all the items are listed with photos. And uh, we also have a very good map. So I ask you to have a good read uh, in our website. And uh, we, well, we have a very strong uh, ground team. Uh, they're very supportive even while we are we, we climbing. Uh, they follow us through a satellite connection, a satellite link called Spot. So your family can know at any given time where you are and is updated every uh, two and a half minutes. So uh, this ground team makes a, a hell of a lot of difference. But any questions you have, uh, please post it under the video or just send it to us at info uh, andis-specialist.com